Yes, what is going on, everybody? We are live. It is Wednesday. Oh, February 4th. We already forget January. We're, we're done with it. You know, welcome to, and you stop saying Happy New Year because you, you've had your month. But uh, this is the 104th episode of the Seacoast Beverage Lab podcast. Uh, I am your host, uh, Brian Aldrich from Seacoast Beverage Lab, and I am drinking a notch left of the dial session IPA. Oh, well, thanks for the applause. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm going session tonight. Uh, I didn't, I, yet again, I haven't had a, a chance to shop right across the street from my place to, to get the beer for tonight's guest, but I could have. Uh, so, that, so again, shame on me. I owe you, I owe everyone 20 push-ups after the show. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, we have a guest tonight. Uh, we're going to get to him in a second. Uh, Carla, what is happening? Hey, guys. Uh, Carla, uh, no, not mine, is the beer babe. Um, I am drinking, actually, a Long Trail Limbo IPA, and actually... For the first time, I was at the beer store, and I realized that Long Trail has, like, four IPAs. I didn't know. <laughs> like, they have their sick day, their regular one, and this, and then something else. So I just uh, I got IPA confused. But I like Limbo. Limbo's, Limbo's a good beer. But. Nice. Uh, Sean O, what's up? Hello, I'm Sean Jansen from TobeerGuys.com. I am currently drinking a Battle Axe IPA from... Kelson Brewing Company. What a badass label that is! Yeah, that <laughs> oh, and we, I mean, if, if we're gonna get into it soon, because the label yeah, are it, all around is like, it's like a, it's like a geek stream because it's so cool, but it's also like a just a badass beer labels all around. Yeah. But, well, uh, but let's not jump into it quickly because we want to introduce our guest, um, Eric Olson from Kelson Brewing. How's it going, Eric? It's going great. Thank you so much for having me. So, uh, I'm Eric Olson. I'm one of the co-founders of Kelson, and happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, what are you drinking tonight? I am drinking a Vendel Imperial Stout. This is our new release. Ooh. I am not going session, so I've been holding off. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, this is 9.4%, and uh, this is brewed with locally roasted coffee and dairy, uh, organic cocoa nibs, and chocolate. So this is a big, hearty, rich, roasty Imperial beer that really fools you with a 9.4%. Look at that. Oh, man. Uh, in store, uh, I'll jump ahead. Is it in stores now? or? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's in stores now. Just just hit stores this week. Well, I know where I'm going tomorrow, so perfect. Because I hear we're getting more snow, which can't be possible. I, I don't even know why I didn't bring it up, because I've, I've almost, I'm numb to it all. Like, we, the outside of each one of our houses right now is feet of snow, tons yeah. of feet. So, we're, and we're all, we're all, like, snow drunk at this point. It's, <laughs> it's unbelievable. I think... I think what, uh, Monday, Tuesday, I got an additional maybe foot, foot and a half? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Additional. I, I don't know <laughs> where else to put it. No, nah, it's true, and that's the thing. And, and I'll, I'll, I don't really listen to New Englanders who complain about the snow because it is what it is, but when it comes to the point of nowhere to put it, I'll take the complaint. It's fine. I'll, I'll listen to them. It's, it's fine. I've got that maximum slope on my driveway where, like, if I put any more on the sides, it's just yeah. going to come back into the driveway, so yeah. I, don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, yes. So, uh, welcome to the Weather Channel podcast. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's get into it, because we have a special guest, and I, I'm horrible at keeping records, but in in a row, we have had one, two, three. You're, you are our fourth New Hampshire brewer in a row in Great. five weeks. So, we, I mean, we really appreciate you coming on, because we like spreading the love here um, of, for the New Hampshire beers, uh, myself, uh, most notably, being in New Hampshire, the only one from in the podcast from New Hampshire. But uh, let's get into it. So we will, just to get the ball rolling. Um, how did you got? How did you guys start, Kelson? Because you're a year old. Yeah, we uh, we sold our first beer March first of last year. Uh, so my good friend from grade school, Paul Kelly, and I uh, were home brewing for a few years in my driveway. Uh, we kept getting bigger and bigger equipment. We kept buying, you know, we got up to twenty six gallon kettles. We were yeah. we're doing twenty gallon batches, and you know, there was nowhere to go bigger than just, you know, going pro. And uh, Paul is a certified hobby addict. And so, ah. uh, you know, we really sat down and talked about it. We, we thought, you know, we've been in kind of full-time day jobs for 16 years. He works in, he worked in finance. I work in software. We thought, you know, we've been doing all this stuff to help other companies for years. Why don't we do something for ourselves? Yeah. So uh, he forced me into it, and <laughs> we, uh, we started Kelson. And the name, awesome. the name comes from Paul Kelly, Eric Olson. That we we put the two names together, and uh, that's how Kelson came about. Oh, that's pretty cool. I I don't I can't remember the last time we had a, a brewery name for for from people, uh, you know, with a person's yeah. name. 
it's a pretty good idea considering pretty. everybody's trademarking every other name in the world. So that's you it. know, yes. that's it. You know, we probably had four or five names that we really wanted before Kelson. And uh, you know, you, you got to have a lawyer. You got to look at trademarks. You can't come come up with a name and then get sued a year later. Yes. So, uh, everything we said, every idea we came up with, got shot down by the attorneys, and so. We <laughs> <laughs> decided so to go, we, go after. Saying, Can you uh, share any? Uh, yeah, you know, one of them was I got to remember them all, but uh, one of them was solitude. Uh, we were trying to think of Paul and I were both big outdoors guys. We like to go skiing, fly fishing, hunting, camping, whatever, hiking. So we're thinking of, you know, how do we represent like our ski history together? And we thought, okay, we're out in the mountain, just two of us brewing you know, or skiing, whatever. So we thought solitude. We thought of uh, uh, white smoke, I think it was, uh, something about that. Um, there were a bunch of outdoors names, and they were, you know, solitude. Obviously, is a, a, a town. There's solitude mountain, so that got shot down. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Uh, we decided, you know, it was one of those things after all that research, we, I came up with Kelson, and he goes, done. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, and now you, you're one of uh, a couple of brewers giving some love to, to not, I say, non-Portsmouth. You, you, actually, you actually moved a little, bit of, a little bit out there. I want to tell us about the area you picked and, and kind of maybe, maybe was it was it coincidence or just you, you knew you wanted to be there? Yeah, so I mean, Derry. We were we were looking at the areas. We thought Manchester. There's already there was already Millie's, and you know there was a there's already a Candy Road Brewing there. Uh, we looked we looked at the, the size of the towns. We looked at London Derry, Salem, Nashua, uh, Derry, and we talked to them all. And Derry immediately said, "We want you," and they they were super supportive. Nice. So there's one thing, especially when you're doing this crazy, you know, opening a brewery thing where you have to have a space and build it out and before you even apply for a license, you need to make sure the town's on your side because uh, the last thing you want to do is get to the end of the road and then, re, you know, run into local issues. So they were on board. The town is awesome and, uh, you know, it was an easy choice for us and we're glad we glad we picked it. That's cool and, and that's and that's great to hear that, that the town w wanted something like that because and, and I'm, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of the towns are, are looking over you know in Manchester and Portland and saying well how can I get that kind of thing out here or in, you know in my town so that's pretty cool that the town wanted you to come in there yeah and you know we stumbled upon the beer scene really I mean we knew 603 was down the street uh, in Londonderry um, you know when we became we, we got to know the folks in the area like Andy day at Cask and vine and Matt at the Lazy Dog and other local places, and from the barrel moved in down the street, yep. um, and now Rockingham Brewery is opening up in uh, Derry. So it kind of became this this hub that we didn't really expect that to happen, uh, but Derry is really picking up as far as being a, a a beer scene in Southern New Hampshire. That's great. That's great. Oh yeah, uh, Carla, hit it. So now, so now that you found a place, um, kind of, can you ask? Can you give us a little bit about you know what? What's your brewery size? You know, what kind of things that you do? Like, what's your setup like right now? Sure. Yeah, we, we opened, uh, we wanted to keep things small and almost have the first year as our pilot, uh, just to prove the concept and make sure we knew what the heck we were doing and, you know, everything's going to work out. So we, we have a three-barrel brew house, uh, and it's electric fire, electric uh, elements, so it's electric heated brew house, um, and we, we double batch everything into seven-barrel uh, fermenters. So uh, they're actually, we didn't go stainless right away because we knew we were going to upgrade quickly. So we have plastic fermenters, food grade fermenters, um, and they're all enclosed individually in uh, temperature controlled rooms. So that's how we control fermentation temps. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and with that, we, you know, one year in, we've kind of hit our target and we're, we're doubling the brew house size uh, right now. Very cool. Um, and we're going to be upgrading to a seven barrel size and getting our first 15 barrel stainless fermenters. So, Yay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I, I forgot to mention uh, before, because I know, Sean, you, you came with a question, but for those that are watching live uh, either on YouTube or Twitch uh, and you want to chat, we, uh, we are fielding questions. Um, I do have a couple coming in now, but I'll, I'll save them for when the time's right. But, Sean, you were, you were coming in with something? Uh, no, I, uh, I just wanted to uh, kind of sort of follow up on what uh, Carla was mentioning is um, kind of getting into how did you – how do you know what was the right size to be for to actually starting? Um. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, you know, certainly it, it came down to spreadsheets, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of calculations. Uh, you know, we had a plan of of going first as self distributed, uh, and then going into using distributors. And we started off kind of assuming that we would be distributed, and uh, you know, 
giving up some of the margin there. So it was really about how much do we think we can produce in a month? You know, what are the costs? What can we get for what? what where do we price beer? And um, you know, knowing that we just want to make the beer we want to make, and then what is it probably going to cost us to make it? How much do we need to make to make a make a profit so we don't go out of business in three months? So. Uh, three barrels we found was uh, in doing six barrel batches was an absolute minimum as far as breaking even, getting by, you know, having a little bit of cash flow month to month. So it was really spreadsheet driven, um, and uh, you know that's I, I yeah that's how we came up with that size. So and then so you you came to market what you came with three beers to market? Yeah, uh, two. We two. started with two. Yep. So okay. Paradigm Brown Ale, which is uh, still our best selling beer, um, and Battle Axe IPA. Nice. Those were the two. We focused on two for a while. Um, we came out with a pale ale about three months in, and then um, and then we started to expand, and we did a double IPA and uh, a porter. Um, so right now, our three main beers are the, the still the Battle Axe and the Brown, and now the Drock and Robust Porter. Oh, I mean, and then Sean's got the label here uh, for for the camera. I mean, it, yeah. what's I, I I need to know, and I'm sure a, a bunch of like. Dungeons and Dragons and gaming <laughs> geeks want to know how, like, what's the inspiration behind these these labels? It's cool. Yeah, so oh, look at that. Look at that friggin' dra- sorry. Look at that dragon. <laughs> the Drakken so, label is definitely my favorite. Uh, awesome. the, the guy with the red beard. Uh, he's Brian fierce. He's crazy. Uh, so Olson is a Norwegian name. Uh, my dad and I used to make wine together in the basement. Uh, not the basement. Well, yeah, as when I was a young kid, you know, we had grapes and he made wine and it was really good. Everything in my life was focused around Viking themes. Uh, nice. So. You know, we'd go camping, we'd have a sign that said it had all the caricatures of the family members as Vikings. Um, and I told Paul, you know, my dad's no longer with us, and I said, you know, I'd love to have this brewery, you know, carry that Viking theme forward. It would be a great homage to my dad, and you know, I know he'd be proud of what we're doing. And uh, Paul's like, dude, Vikings are badass, absolutely. So, <laughs> um, so we started off with, like, stories around each of the labels and what they meant to us, and then we uh, went on Elance. Um, a uh, freelancing website. We found a guy who had a look that we were going for, and he was awesome. And so, you know, we did the first two labels, and we stuck with it. And he's our he's our guy. So uh, he's I think he's probably like a 19 year old kid in Western Canada somewhere. That great. I don't know, he's a nut, but he's awesome. So we're uh, super happy. That's cool. And I, so I, I guess so. We, we we talked a little bit about the labels and the beers themselves. Um, did. Did you have any when you, in your home brewing days? Did you have a specific beer you you went to or you brewed that kind of was the uh, inspiration for your first beers at Kelson? Yeah, definitely. So the uh, the Paradigm Brown Ale is was our was our go to beer. So it's a it's a very hoppy brown ale. It's got these unique flavors in the middle that are kind of hard to describe. You know, I've heard people say anywhere from like a root beer flavor to a Tootsie Roll to this uh, you know really bitter chocolate, uh, but it, it's a very hoppy nose to it. And it was really, really hard to find anything on the shelf that had that really hoppy aroma uh, in the nose and had that full flavored or full mouth feel that we had in our brown ale. So 7% beer. And, uh, you know, we, since we couldn't find it, we knew we wanted to bring that to market. And uh, we're really just happy that other people like it too. And it's, uh, it's become a, a go-to beer for bars and, and people, uh, people want to drink it. So it's really yeah. cool. There's not a whole lot of breweries whose flagship that, you know, they have a large following behind a brown ale. That's, yeah. it's, it struck me immediately when you said that, like, oh, our best-selling ones are a brown ale and an IPA. And I went, what? Whoa. <laughs> oh, that, that's about the quality of this brown ale because, you know, they, they have a tendency to be kind of a middle-of-the-road style, but that's that's awesome that you've, you know, kind of found a way to, to make it yours and, and run with it. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it, um I, I don't think we ever thought that would be our, our flagship. You know, we, we knew we wanted to bring it to market, but I always thought the IPA is going to sell better, right? And uh, so we, you know, we, we designed the label for Paradigm. The, the story behind it is that it's, uh, par- I mean, your Paradigm is your view, and we think that when people drink that, it can change their view of what a brown ale can be. And so it's a, it's a blacksmith on the label who's going like this, and it's because he just went to a bar and he doesn't drink brown ales. And we get that reaction all the time. I don't drink brown ales. Yeah. Oh my God! You know. Yeah. Those people. That's cool. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it it must be. Were were you nervous uh, on the reception of a dark beer to start? Cause as Carla was Definitely. saying, not many people's flagships are brown, but I mean, just in general, and as as you were saying, people are pretty hesitant towards browns in general. Absolutely. Yeah. No. It was. Uh, it was not a total unknown. Uh, yeah. I can't. I can't say we we planned it uh, that way. Um, so cool. we thought we thought it would be more the IPA for sure. 
And I think uh, I think Sean has did. Am I am I right in reading? You've uh, you've won some awards already. You haven't even been open a year. We did, yeah. Oh so gosh. we um, we entered two international competitions: the uh, the U.S. Open uh, beer beer competition in uh, Atlanta in July, nice. and Paradigm won gold, and our Double Battle Axe IPA won bronze. Um, Very cool. And then in November we entered the uh, Great International Beer Fest in Providence. And we won uh, the Draken Robust Porter won gold and Paradigm won bronze again. So, yeah, we're, we feel very uh, very fortunate for that. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's really kind of rewarding to to have that beer win two awards in a year. It's pretty amazing. Oh yeah, jeez, that's awesome. Um, can I I'll hop in with a quick uh, chat question? Kind of mix it Absolutely. up a little bit. Uh, this one's on Twitch coming from Egon Bach. So the, the question is, what is, I mean, and we can do a round table, but we'll start with you, uh, if, if you don't mind, Eric. Um, favorite pizza to go with beer? Oh, wow. And, and maybe if you have, maybe put one of your beers in there. Yeah, I, um, I, I like, uh, you know, a good pepperoni pizza to go with beer. I like, I like, especially with those dark beers, I like that spice in the, in the, in the uh, pepperoni to kind of balance out the dark malts. So nice. that's probably where I would go. Nice. Uh, Carla, favorite pe- favorite pizza. And by the way, let me go first because I I just I just had I think that very special combination this weekend. I was up in Portland and went to Slab. Oh, Slab is and, fantastic. And, and the, the, these fluffy pillows of, of pizza that they delivered with, and huge. It's awesome. But uh, it paired nicely. I had the uh, the tributary black IPA with, with the that. spicy meat wedge or whatever. Yeah, oh yeah, it was ridiculous. And I'm like, mm-hmm. she warned us, oh, you can't have a whole pizza. So, but <laughs> pizza, and I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not picking the beer. I, I, I love the dark beers, so I, I can't wait to, can't wait to try the, uh, the Imperial Stout, uh, cool. especially the Robust Porter. But, um, but yeah, a dark beer and, and, and just a meaty pizza, as Vikings probably would. Just yeah. to, if, if pizza was, in, was around in the Viking times. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Carla, what do you think? Um, I, I'm a big fan. I miss, uh, I used to live in Dover, New Hampshire, and they have a place there called La Festa, and they have a buffalo chicken pizza where they put both uh, the hot sauce and the blue cheese like in a swirl on the top of it. And uh, that, they used to also have uh, like a dogfish head 60 minute on tap all the time, so like the IPA and the buffalo spices was just like, it was my little heaven. It was great. <laughs> and Sean, do you, do you eat pizza? I know you're very picky. I do, I do, right. and uh, I'm gonna have to say, I'm gonna have to throw it out there: a good old uh, bacon and sausage combo pizza. Oh, combo! Um, nice. And I'd like to have a uh, pretty hoppy pale ale for that. Excellent, good stuff. Um, do we have any chat questions on your end, by chance yet? If not, uh, no. But we do have. I just want to say a quick shout out to uh, Johnny Beer. Um, he's currently enjoying a. Uh, a beast mode by six point, um, crushing the can after he's done. Says go Pats. Excellent. Um, uh, so we're having a nice little conversation there in the chat room. Oh, yeah, nice. And um, I, I guess while while we're talking, we talked about barrel size and how, and how you pick that. Um, why don't you describe a little bit of the of the tasting room you have there and and kind of the the scene around that. Yeah, we have a, a very small nondescript tasting room, so it's definitely not fancy. Uh, you know, it's it's there. We kept it kept it small and kind of standing room only for the most part, uh, where people can come in and really talk to us about the beer. We want to be face to face with people as uh, they come in and sample beers. We don't want them taking samples and walking away to sit down with their friends. Uh, so it's probably 500 square feet. Um, you know, it probably could hold about 12, 15 people at a time. But uh, people come in, they ask us about the beer. We talk to them. They ask they ask a, a lot of questions about how we brew it, why we do why we do what we do. Um, so it's really about Educating people about our beers and beers in general, and uh, you know what we're trying to do with a beer. So that's it's about that personal relationship that we want to establish with people who drink it. Uh, Sean. So, um, Eric, I, I know that uh, you guys are pretty active in social media, and I know that um, there's uh, many different channels out there that that you guys use. Um, and if, for example, you guys are currently doing a partnership with Untapped. Can you guys? As a small brewer, can you explain what you guys use for tools and sort of um, a little give a little the listeners a backstory about the Untapped deal that's going on? Yeah, so you know, I actually still have a day job uh, for now, and I, I actually sell uh, marketing software for a living. So I have access to uh, 
some great software that I, I use for email marketing and social listening. And, and really the social listening is about just hearing what people are talking about us and, and uh, you know, if they're on you know, Beer Advocate Forum and they're mentioning our brand, I want to be engaged in that conversation and talk to them about it. You know, and so, uh, you know, we, we also use those tools for publishing events on Twitter and Facebook and other social channels. Um, <clears throat> as far as unt the Untapped promo, that was actually, uh, uh, you know, more of Andy from Cask and Vine pushing. <laughs> it was actually he his idea and his promo. He just happened to put all the promotional out output on us. So it was kind of like in our name, uh, but he was actually the sponsor of that whole thing, and uh, we just... Let him say, okay, when you check in at our place, you get a coupon at his store. So uh, we were very fortunate that it was really him that drove that. Um, but, yeah, we actually sit down on a weekly basis and map out kind of what we're doing from an email perspective, what we're doing from a social perspective, what, what are the big events coming up, how do we promote them, and it's a, it's a team effort. Um, so that's, that's really how we think about it, and we happen to have some nice tools at our disposal. Very cool. And, do you, and, do you yeah. feel that other breweries your size are doing the same thing? You know, I think people do a pretty good job. I, honestly, I you know we keep I keep I just use some basic Facebook skill uh, tools too to kind of keep track of how many likes people are getting and where we rank and how are people doing. It's just the the basic insights in Facebook, and I think you know Abel Ebenezer does a great job. Beautiful marketing, beautiful campaigns. You know, six hundred three has a lot of likes. They're really getting uh, they're over six thousand likes now. So you know, I think a lot of people are doing well, and uh, you know the beauty of it is it can be a very affordable way to to get the word out. You can you can promote your posts and make a little bit you know pay a little bit of money to to get them out there, but you know there's there's really no no way to better reach your audience than you know Twitter and Facebook right now Instagram, so I think people are doing doing a good job. That's true. Uh, I, I guess I'll I'm, I'll kind of piggyback off of that and try to in, in expanding your your reach. Have you found it in your first year tough for people to come out? I I say come out to dairy. It's it's close. It's closer than people think. But um, have have there be, been people that have expressed their uh, their adventure and say, oh, we've we've came all this way to, to a place that's not Portsmouth. So I find yeah. I find it tough for a lot of the breweries that aren't in Portsmouth to kind of get that that initial push of of, uh, of fans. Yeah, it, yeah, definitely. Um, I, I do think that's that's probably has been a challenge for us. Uh, you know, getting. We run into people all the time that have never heard of us. Even people that live in Derry haven't heard of us. So it's not just getting people from Portsmouth or other parts of the, uh, uh, you know, other parts of the state. So it, it is hard to get the word out and get people to know that there's something in your backyard that's, you know, someone who's making good beer locally. So we, but we're now starting to see people come up from Rhode Island, from Connecticut, from Vermont, and they come to the tasting room to try the beer because they heard about it on Beer Advocate or, you know, a podcast, Tap Handle Show, you know. Yeah. So it, you know, they're they're getting. Uh, People are people are starting to come out from different locations and, and come directly to our place, which is great. Awesome. Uh, Carly, you got something? Um, or, yeah, I. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about um, you know, so we don't talk to a lot of breweries that are you know kind of as young as you guys are. Can you tell us a little bit about like who works for you guys? You know, how many people are in your team? Like how. You know, have you have you hired more than you know just the brewer? Because you know we see a lot of you know people who you know kind of started out like you, you know, in the garage, just you know by themselves, and it takes them a while to get a team. Yeah. Of people. Just curious about you know kind of <laughs> the makeup of your company. Yeah, we we planned we we did uh, end up executing kind of on the plan we had uh, from the start. So we Paul and I both started off working full time, and we only brewed on weekends, which is almost impossible to do. It's so hard because there's so much more to do than just brewing. There's packaging, there's cleaning, there's fermentation control, there's all deliveries and all these things that happen. So yeah. right about three months in, as soon as we signed our distribution agreements, Paul went full-time. So we had him going full-time, and then uh, just about three months ago, we hired on uh, our tasting room manager, who's a, uh, a full-time employee now, Cool, uh, Mike. So Mike's, Mike's done awesome, and you know now that we're kind of ramping up and trying to double our production this year... We're definitely going to bring on some more employees, so um, we're not sure quite the breakdown, but probably a couple of uh, part-time employees to help with packaging and to help with tasting room, and probably going to let Mike move on to the operation side of things and kind of get his experience around the brewery. He's a he's a great asset, and we're really lucky to have him. So uh, he's got he's actually a, a graphic designer and got a lot of social marketing experience. So more than just a, a beer lover and a you know tasting room guy, he's also uh, very versatile. So. That's the right now. It's the three of us kind of doing the full time thing, and uh, we have, we'll have more people coming on this year. Very cool. so, and with with more people, do, do you see the need for uh, 
any capacity uh, expansion? I mean, I know it's obviously early on, but uh, do, you, do you need? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we, yeah, we'll um, basically by May we'll have at least t double our capacity. Um, so if we get right Excellent. now, we have six uh, six barrel fermenters, and if we bring on two more fifteens, um, then you know it will. And we have a seven barrel brew house. Uh, we won't have to do those double batches all the time. We'll be able to put out you know, those eight batches a month into six sixes and two fifteens. So we'll we'll more than double our capacity pretty quickly. Right, so you means, have, you you have room for that? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, we have plenty of room and oh, you know the cool. big thing is capital. It's it, it's you need to have so we'll have to have a hundred more kegs. So we'll have to have uh, more bottles, more grain, more everything. And it, it's it's just when you do those kind of expansions, everything gets more expensive. So um, which is great. It's okay. It's fun. You know? <laughs> so that's why we're doing it. Um, but uh, yeah, that all that stuff is actually being ordered very, very soon, and will be in the in the um, brew house by May, I think. Awesome. So get down there, people. What are you guys waiting for? More <laughs> beer. <laughs> now, Eric, you've uh, mentioned uh, a couple times that you've uh, added a distributor. Can you go through that thought process of when you originally came up with your business plan and and then went from self distributing to uh, signing with the distributor? And kind of the, give us the big picture of um, what you guys went through. Yeah, yeah. So, I for the first three months, I drove around the state of New Hampshire from the, from the seacoast, Derry, Manchester area to the Lakes region, and uh, was was bringing beer around in my free time, off hours, you know, nights, weekends, whenever. And uh, there was no doubt that after doing that, and you know, it was it we we opened twenty craft beer store accounts, uh, off premise accounts. But there were, you know, getting into restaurants and doing that on a broader scale was just impossible for a guy in a in an SUV to do that. And uh, we knew that was going to be the case. So, you know, we looked for the right partner. We looked for the right team that could, uh, number one, have a, 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 a presence in the street, have a, a real sales team out there, uh, people with relationships, and also just the ability to help us, you know, build the brand. And so... Uh, you know, Sean is one of our uh, one of our guys. Uh, nice. New Hampshire Craft Alliance. So it's Bellavance, NHD, Clark, and White Mountain, and uh, they're doing an awesome job. And you know, for us, it was just we're part of the plan from the start. We just we just knew we couldn't couldn't get the reach. Um, and the way kind of the way the New Hampshire finance stuff works, you know, you got to be pretty much COD if you're distributing yourself, and that's very difficult to do with restaurants and bars. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> yeah, the distributor was definitely part of the plan. And, and as far as um, uh, c container, like it's a stupid. Uh, I, I know I'm, I know Sean. There's probably a better th better term for it. What packages are you currently available in? Yes. What yeah. pa excuse <laughs> me. What are you yeah, we, uh, <laughs> we're we're 22 ounce bottles um, yeah. right now, and also six barrel logs in awesome. uh, on prem accounts. So in bars and restaurants. So nice. that's it's it works out well for us because with those logs we can reach more accounts. Um, you know, we can we can cycle. You can rotate brands through better, and uh, it works. It works out well. So right now we have about 120 logs in our uh, keg inventory. We're gonna get another hundred uh, soon. So um, and then so we just keep getting. If there's bottles. somebody in New Hampshire not in Derry looking for your beer, like where should they look for your beer on tap? Do you have just a couple of like areas that you guys been sending out to? Yeah, uh, so in Manchester, uh, Murphy's, is, we're in Murphy's, we're at uh, Strange Brew uh, in Manchester, we're, we're at 815, which is a new, new awesome, awesome pre-prohibition bar on Ooh. Elm Street. Oh, cool. uh, Tucked Away Tavern is a, is a great bar for us, they, uh, they have awesome food and they, they usually always have our beer on tap. Uh, we're kind of up and down the, the Route 102 there from Hudson at Northside Grill, um, London Dairy at Cafe Teresa's. Um, there's a, there's actually Tuck away Tavern. Tuck away, yeah, Tuck away yeah. Kathleen's Cottage up in Bristol. Um, so oh. I'm I'm sure I'm leaving a lot off. <laughs> no, no, I, I didn't mean for you to list them all, but no, that's awesome. Thanks because you know the people who listen also want to know how they can get a hold of it, and yeah. uh, if it's in their area, you know they can look out for it. it is, is there an easy way? Uh, is there a way to, to figure out? Is there an, on your website? Yes. Some places. Oh, cool. Yeah, we have a beer track. We have a um, a beer finder. Yes, and you put in your zip code, and it will show you all the accounts. There's about, I think, there's about 81 maybe right now uh, between stores and, and restaurants. Cool. So, Brian, even if you want to get a little bit more geekery, and you may it. or may not have noticed it. Yeah. Um, if if you can see it right here in the bottle. Yes. Um, and Beer right track. there, 
bottle number. You'll you'll see a tracker and a, a number. Yeah. And I was actually playing around with it today with a couple bottles where you could put that number in the website what? and get details of that batch that they were brewing and they have some brewing notes on there. So if something changed slightly, a little hop differential or whatever, wow. or even the the uh, additional information that like super beer geeks would want to know, you can sort of look at from their label. It seems like right up Carla's alley right there. Carla's, 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 the, Carla's the, the, the data mine of... of <laughs> that's great. It's cool. Yeah, and we've, um, we've also now uh, enabled that on the mobile device, too. So you can text in uh, to, uh, to a, a code. Of course, I should have it memorized, but I don't. <laughs> but you, you text into the short code, and you put the word uh, track, and then you follow it by the beer number, and it will respond with an SMS with the, be- the details of when it was brewed, when it was bottled, who brewed it. That is Excellent. so cool. Yeah, oh, okay, so, so I'm trying that. I'm going to try that ASAP. That. That's so fun. It's, it's, it's part of me being lazy, because I didn't oh. want to go through the effort of having a, uh, you know, a, a, a enjoy by date on every label, so I just decided right. to put a sequential number on every bottle, and you could look up when the when the beer was brewed. So, so oh, how, do you, how do you know... How do you do it with each printed label? <laughs> so we, have, uh, we order 4,000 <laughs> labels at a time on these rolls, and, and when we're done labeling, or we, we label the bottles first before we bottle, and we just know, we, we indicate which one we start with and which one we end with, and then we upload that to our database and uh, put in the notes, and then it, it, it keeps that sequence of, of bottles there. So when we're bottling, we know that everything that we're putting in there is for that batch. So cool. So awesome. we're expecting that one of the next notes that you put up there is going to yeah. say, "Watch us on the Seacoast Bev Lab podcast," <laughs> yeah. and have a link to your show. And some some lucky people are going to be looking up, are going to get a little uh, Easter egg and finding the show. No, in, absolutely, in this Easter egg, no tonight. doubt, absolutely. Easter, yeah. <laughs> and I for for a quick second, and I I didn't mean to undermine your 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 awesome database, but when Sean showed me the the bottle tracker, I'm like, okay, so they recycle the bottles. And it's kind of like a chart, like, where was his dollar <laughs> before? <laughs> so it was in Sean's mouth. Uh, <laughs> trying to hear. No, but that, it, that's it's a way, uh, my mind was way better, but that's awesome. You know, the, um, the yeah. real next step, though, is that on your bottle tracker, for that specific batch is to allow someone to add a comment yep. of what they thought about the beer when they were trying that. Cool. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Not currently available, but maybe available in the future. Yes. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, Because that's that's our way of, you know, once the bottles leave our hands, you know, we never can reconnect with that bottle and that person. So this is our way of getting the person who has the bottle in their hand, come to our website, reach out to us, and we should be able to reach out to them and, and get their feedback. So you're absolutely spot on. It's a whole other level of not even social media. That's just like... That's just crazy. That's it's craziness. It, yeah. it, it's nothing. It's yeah. That's it's just another another way to to reach you that a lot of other breweries don't even think about, which is great. Yeah. That's great. I, I I can only think of the only only other brewery that I can think of is Backlash using their uh, their hashtags uh, or hashtags there's, their um, uh, QR codes on their on their bottles. But I, I like one of their New Hampshire um, cidery that does something similar. Yeah. Um, that they put information on the bottle to tell you about the specific blend of the cider in the batch, and that's pup okay. cider. Okay. So you'll see like a batch number on that, and you can sort of you can go to their website and search that batch, or a certain website search that batch and figure out what right. that exact cider blend but, was. But uh, going but back to, to your idea uh, there, Sean, about you know having uh, you know having that be a way a venue for feedback. One of the things about Untapped that drives me crazy is that, like, I'll see somebody check into a beer and they'll say, this is awful, it's, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I don't know if they got that beer fresh from the brewery or if they got that beer after it had been in the back of their pickup truck, you know, getting hot for two, three weeks. You know, like, I have no idea where, you know, what, you know, what kind of freshness it is or, you know, when it was made or any of that. So there's a disconnect between the experience of the consumer and the and the actual, you know, what happened to it and how fresh it is. Yeah. Uh, I was actually at a beer store today, and I saw a spring seasonal beer, and I actually did a double take because I wasn't sure if it was this spring's mm-hmm. or last spring's, and oh, I didn't yeah. buy it because I didn't know. Um, so, it's uh, so that kind of data, you know, you know, it sounds geeky to people, but it, it's it's important information. Um, oh, yeah, it's it's going to help it, our consumers and and the yeah. brewers ultimately, you know. So yeah. I think you're a pioneer in that. So keep doing, keep doing that. Yep. 
Finally, Carl likes New Hampshire beer. No, I'm kidding. Hey, <laughs> no, I no, 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 I don't. You live in New Hampshire. I love it. You just <laughs> just it kidding. The <laughs> just because she's up north. Don't worry about that. No. You you heard it here right now. Something that a New Hampshire brewery is doing that a Maine brewery is not. Yeah. No, there's nobody doing that up here. That we know of. Hallelujah. That I know. But yes. Uh, um, yeah, we got, what do we if I can here? interrupt here, we do have a question from uh, Johnny Beer in the chat. Sweet. Uh, Johnny Beer would like to know, Eric. Um, with the amount of breweries that have been opening up, um, and there's got to be uh, an equal amount of demand for ingredients out there across the board, have you had any trouble uh, getting uh, ingredients, and specifically any of the hop varieties that you've been looking for? Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's a, a demystifying, I guess is the right word. I don't know. It's a, it's a very challenging process when you go from home brewing, when you go to a home brew shop or morebeer.com, and you can buy an ounce of whatever you want. It's it's all available. Just got to pay a dollar, you know, four dollars a, a for each packet. Uh, and when you go to be a, a pro brewer, you see that you know you need 200 pounds of hops, and and they're they're all coming co from a contract somewhere. So we we had trouble finding the the, the hops that we wanted the first year, um, but we did find a small um, producer of pelletized hops from uh, Washington. And we were able to contract with him. He he actually produces the nice small 11-pound bales that make it easy for us to manage. And we got all but two hop varieties that we wanted from him. We we couldn't get, I think it was Centennial, and we couldn't get Amarillo. So we uh, we did find you know you go on Pro Brewer and you can find people putting up their their maybe uh, last year's hops or they have excess from the current year. And we bought a 44-pound box from this guy and this guy and. Uh, so we got our Centennial, and then we couldn't get Amarillo, and then finally, about six months in, we managed to get our hands on a couple hundred pounds of Amarillo. So we we uh, we finally got that, and we just keep stocking up on it whenever we can. Uh, and but you know, we're definitely starting to contract out you know years in advance, uh, which is what you kind of have to do, and you know you've got to pay that down payment and you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's you know it's part of the process, and you know we were lucky to find a nice small business that was able to help out other small businesses, and and that's great. And uh, you know we'll just keep searching for hops as we as we can find them. Now uh, it's kind of a two part question, um, but I'm not sure how to ask it. So maybe you, or maybe, I'm not sure in what order, so you can answer in whatever order you wish. Uh, first one is uh, what if what future beers are you thinking of creating, and the Maybe the question that should be asked before is if you have an idea for a beer that requires something that you haven't contracted out years in ahead, how do you how do you plan for the the unplanned beers? You know. Yeah, yeah. So we have a good variety that we we contracted actually some hops that we don't necessarily use yet. Um, okay. So we did uh, knowing that we probably want to do something, uh, you know, with a mosaic. We contracted two hundred pounds of mosaic, and we haven't used that in a beer yet, but we will. Um, if, nice. if not, you'll be able to trade that for pretty yeah. much yep. anything. <laughs> so, cool. you know, we were we were looking for some experimental hops this year. We actually did contract for one. It was going to be kind of unique to New England. It was a hop called G1. Doesn't mean anything, but uh, it came from a small farmer that this uh, gentleman we work with had a connection with. It turns out we didn't get any hops. They just didn't get it. Didn't didn't yield anything this year. So, uh, so we did. We kind of you know prospectively go out there and, and ask for certain hops and see if we can get them. And then, you know, we also do have to think about when we design some of those beers, uh, you know, do we, you know, so we, we have Willamette, Chinook, we have all these different hops that we may not use a lot of right now, but we could always incorporate those into those beers. Or there's now the Lupulin Exchange, which is a kind of a publicly trade, uh, public tr uh, marketplace where you can put hops up and, and trade what? and exchange and buy. It's like um, for hops. Like, yeah, it's like StubHub, like yeah. I don't want people, you know, that kind of, like, you know, is the only awesome. real currency Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Dogecoin. So that's where I got Amarillo. I got 200 pounds of Amarillo from there. So um, that's cool. Yeah. So that's that's great. You know, and so beer is coming up. We uh, we have this beer called Vignata, which we've put out a video on. It's going to be a 12% Russian Imperial Stout. Mm -hmm. We actually brewed it Monday and Tuesday this week. Yes. Um, it's fermenting away with Nottingham yeast. It is. Uh, we've never used that yeast before, and it's explosive. Uh, <laughs> nice. The fermenter, the blow-off tube was uh, was no match for this beer, so oh. uh, it is everywhere, all of the brewery floor. Um, yes. Way Sorry. over came the bucket, and it's awesome. Uh, it's it's an angry, angry yeast. It's, uh, <laughs> it's 64 degrees. It's not too hot, but it's it's going like crazy. Um, so that's nice. that's a 12% beer. Um, 
it's all we did four mashes to get 200 gallons. Uh, so two, how, two how mashes on take? two days. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty uh, pretty big beer. Nice. I, I, I can picture the like a, a, an advertisement if it, say we're on the Super Bowl or something. These Vikings on a ship with the barrel of that beer that's being brewed just heading towards America. Yeah. And like this beer is coming for you on these <laughs> this angry Viking ship. That's that's pretty cool. Um, yes. If yeah. uh, any of the visitors go to our website, we have a little slider on the homepage, and the, the video plays the, the loop when you first get there. And uh, it's a collaboration beer we did with Cask and Vine and awesome. Andy Day, and he actually produced the video. It's pretty amazing. Uh, it takes all the characters from our labels, and they all kind of come together. Oh, nice. And the the word vinata is Norse for friendship, so it's really a beer that's meant to be consumed with friends, um, and that's why we brewed it with Andy because he's been a great supporter of us. So. Cool. I've actually got a question uh, that just came at me from Twitter. Um, nice. uh, Joey Burks is asking um, if you plan on doing any barrel aged beers at any point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm a big believer that you know uh, that the the wave of barrel aging and sour beers is going to hit here hard. You know, probably in a, a two years, I think it's going to happen. And I I love sour beers. I love barrel aged beers. Um, we actually took some second runnings from Vignata. Uh, they were, believe it or not, the second runnings were uh, 1080. So they were we, they were strong enough to make an 8% beer, pretty much. And uh, we pitched, we put it in a 10 gallon bourbon barrel that we have, and we pitched some Brett. So it's going to be an all Brett fermentation, and it's really just for fun uh, to see what happens. But in a couple of years, we'll let you know. <laughs> but absolutely, we have a new warehouse space. Uh, we plan uh, we plan to get into barrel aging. Um, it's not going to happen probably this summer, but. As we go into the winter of this year, we'll we'll probably uh, invest in a lot of barrels and start start doing a barrel program. And I guess uh, to kind of go on to uh, go off of Joey's question, casks, uh, firkins, or uh, have you had? Do you have experience, or, or do you do you want to try? Uh, I do want to try. It. I don't have any experience with it, so I, I do want to try it. I think it's awesome. I, I I love real beer, real ale. So I think nice. um, I enjoy drinking them, and I think it'd be fun to brew them. I just haven't. I've never done it. So. Sweet. Um, we, uh, Sean, what was I going to say? Did you post a link? Pours and Beer Week's coming up. Do, are you are you involved in any such capacity? Yes. Um, yeah, as much as we can be. So uh, we have, we do have trouble with our capacity getting a lot of beer out to Portsmouth. Um, sure. Kind of like the Portsmouth Brew is having trouble getting all their beer, you know, into the Manchester dairy area. Um, so we are. We're going to do some tastings. We're going to do some uh, some events um, at different bars and. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of them being Sean's event. Um, awesome. At uh, the Port Yep. Nice. That's, okay. a, and that's a great place have, to be. We'll have this beer on tap there. Oh, so, oh, I'll, be, yeah. I'll be there. So say no more. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, yeah. So and, and that, that's a great, it's a great place to be. And, and we'll be we we'll talking about it. I mean, Jesus, was it two weeks, three weeks, Sean? Yeah. yeah. Portsmouth Port oh, Beer Week oh, takes place before. from uh, February twenty first to March second. Um, the Seacoast Winter Brew Fest is two sessions on Saturday, February 21st. Um, it is inside and outside. Um, the beer list is about 60% complete. There's probably there will be 30 plus breweries, 100 plus beers. Um, so. It's going to be a very, very uh, small, intimate crowd. Uh, with uh, this year, we've actually added a second VIP session. So um, first session, first it's like eleven to four, and then uh, no eleven to three, and then four to eight. If you're VIPs, both times. Cool. Secretswinnerbrewfest.com. Yep. Get in there. So that so yes, and we'll be talking about that because that's that's too it's quick. We're, we're coming in hot on that date. Um, we're we're also doing a live podcast uh, at the coat of arms, which we will talk about later. Um, but uh, I, I I hate to hate to go on a ramble about that, even though we're all we're all involved in some capacity. But I, I, we have a we Eric usually how we end the show, and I've I know you said you've watched and listened, and I, pre and I appreciate it. Uh, we we like to kind of ask the same question to everyone uh, that we have on the show. Um, as as a new brewer, um, and as even as an experienced home brewer, um, what what is your advice if say someone were to come into your your tasting room or see you at a beer fest? Uh, and say, I want to start my own brewery. What, what's kind of some of the advice you would give to someone that would ask you that? 
Yeah, so uh, there's there's the kind of big picture advice and there's the tactical advice. You know, big picture, you know, you, obviously you have to have a love of beer and, and love of brewing, uh, but brewing is such a small part of the of of the of the job, right? So I, you know, Paul and I both love to brew beer and we really enjoy it, but it's probably about what we do, you know, six days a month, and then the other 24 are spent with finance and accounting and you know, managing a tasting room and distributing beer, talking to people, selling, uh, doing events, uh, compliance and filings and all those things. So you really want to be, you really go into it knowing that you're running a manufacturing business um, and that your passion for your craft is going to ca- kind of carry you through it and it's ultimately your product, uh, yeah. but you still, and beyond all that, you're running a plant, you're running a manufacturing facility. So you got to be ready for that and, and know that, you know, if you if really what you want to do is brew beer, just you're probably better off staying home brewing beer because uh, that's you'll 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 spend more time brewing at home than you probably would um, when you're on a brewery, believe it or not. That's, I haven't <laughs> heard that before, and it's crazy because we haven't heard that answer before. It's that's good perspective. Oh, really? <laughs> no. Nope. Yeah, I mean, you know, we find it very challenging to get even uh, you know six batches of beer out a month um, because of the packaging and all the things that go into it. So. Uh, that's that's my advice, and you know, it's actually Bill from White Birch gave me the same advice. He's like, if you love brewing, don't become a brewer. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Hey, take note. <laughs> um, and then I would say, you know, you def I would definitely recommend, unless you're independently wealthy, you know, start as big as you think you can handle. Um, you know, we went with three barrels. You know, it's it probably wouldn't have been too much more money for us to go to seven. Um, so, yeah. but. You know, uh, you know. For, certainly, I think 15 barrels is a, is a is a size of a brewery that makes you very uh, functioning long term, right off the right off the right yeah. out of the gate. So three barrels is tough, and I, w- I would not recommend people going smaller than that. Yeah. Um, and I think I think all of the small breweries that are opening up need to really focus on quality. You know, it's it's good for everybody, and you know, talk to your local brewers, talk to your peers, ask for their advice because uh, you we really just want to make sure that. Every beer that we make is uh, is world class and, and exceptional, and you know not tasting like homebrew. Because if somebody comes into a, our tasting room and tries our beer and they think it tastes like homebrew, it could turn them off from any other sure. uh, craft beer. And you know we're all in this together. We all want to take over. Uh, it also says that the they key, can say, "I can make it." <laughs> the, oh, keys, yeah. the keys of the kingdom for for the beer world are being handed over to the craft beer generation, and we need to make sure that we give everybody a great experience when they when they try that craft beer. So. You know, over the next 10 years, that you know, as pe- more and more get into craft beer, it's going to shift, and it's not people aren't going to be reaching for those six packs of, or 30 packs of bud. They're going to be going for their craft beer. So, I mean, and, sure they're all good. Yeah, I mean, if for those that are listening or watching, you're not going to get that kind of uh, that kind of answer or 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 speech from uh, some Super Bowl ad, if you know what I'm saying. So. Yeah. <laughs> Take that to the bank. That's 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 awesome. Carla, thoughts on thoughts on that? No, it, it's that I love these answers. I love. Them. <laughs> As you say, yeah, they're all, they're always so, they're always different. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm and I'm still curating that last little you know present for you guys um, for the kind of compilation of these answers. But I just love how we've had all these guests and they all have something different, like <laughs> some different perspective. But uh, I but I you know that's very cool. Uh, but and and it's funny because we we have yet to have someone. I don't even think. Even even the the richest of brewers like Sam Caljohn, he didn't he'd even say, oh yes, become a brewer. Like there's there's always some little bit of like, like pump the brakes a second here, work it out. Not like think about it. Think come about on it. in. Like hey, sure. Well, it's, you it's, know, any good endeavor deserves a little thought. You know. Yeah. But totally. uh, you know, but more power to everybody who takes that risk and you know goes for it. So more power to you. Absolutely. Yeah. We uh we love all the we love all the small brewers in our area and you know all the new ones popping in popping up uh there it's it's just great to have this this community and we're kind of all in it together you know we're all yeah. trying to build that that following and and get people to really embrace the craft beer thing so great it's it's a great community Hampshire, come on I mean it, it, we we have, we have enough weird laws anyway so <laughs> it's, it's time we just kind of plant our own stakes in the ground and and make our own beer here which yeah. I'm I'm a big fan of and then let Sean bring it to our doorsteps I mean it's the circle of life. Okay, yeah, it's, it's perfect. Um, look, I gotta clap for myself, right? Yeah, I was like, what are you <laughs> tell you <laughs> uh, But yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for that answer. I, I know we we usually end about now, but Sean, did you want to talk just a just a hair about uh, the Super Bowl? 
No, I, th- I think we should. You guys, we sort of talked about it yeah. pre-game, as you sure, would say, we before it. we got onto the um, before we got onto the the video tonight. Uh, yeah. That we, everyone watched the Super Bowl. Uh, Patriots versus uh, Seahawks is a great win. Um, there was a there was a in the craft world. Uh, I think most craft people were all of a sudden like firing up their Twitter after um, after halftime, uh, based on a uh, commercial that was played during um, the I think the second quarter, uh, okay. basically portraying um, uh, the the mega craft side of the brewery business of uh, their perspective on their. On their product, of actually, it was it was a Budweiser video. Um, I don't know, Carl. Do you want to explain yeah, a little bit more? Uh, yeah. So it, it was Budweiser. Basically, the first I think it was the first time Budweiser ever looked that camera in the eye and said, "Our drinkers are like this, and our craft drinkers are not like this." It's really you know, it's not puppies and horses and whatever. It was. <laughs> Here's what we picture our drinkers to be, and if you want to be in our club, you're like that, and if you want to be outside of that club, you're a geek, and you're weird, and you think too hard about your beer. Um, and I wrote a thing about it that night at, like, 1 in the morning. Um, I just dissected the commercial, and a really scary amount of people read it. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's been um, nonstop um, discussion on my blog about it and, you know, why do you even care? It's just a beer ad, to everything to, you know, okay, we're going to boycott Budweiser now because they're all anti-craft. But I just think it's really interesting to see that basically it's, it's an, it is a encapsulation of what Budweiser thinks of craft beer. There's all kinds of irony and hypocrisy in it because obviously they just brought these craft breweries and have said, oh, we're going to keep them just the way they are and you know, we're going to buy a lazy and that has all these pumpkin beers, but then we're going to make fun of pumpkin beer. You know, so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to it. Um, yeah. But I just think it's it's interesting to he- actually hear that perspective from them. That is what their message is. And, and I, uh, yeah. you know, I, decide what, as craft people, um, and, and, as, and I think the craft brewers do too, if they're going to have to fight that or if they're just going to be happy carrying along, you know, catering to the geeks or do they really want people to believe, you know, not believe the fact that, you know, beer isn't fussy and beer isn't—I don't know. Yeah, well, it, it's all—it's all marketing at the end. At the end of it all, they—they they found a good uh, ad agency similar to the—I the, mm-hmm. think it was the Samsung commercial, like way back in the day, where they're like, yeah. the headphone port is on the bottom, like that, like. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> a certain subset of people that will that they'll talk about it, which which we all did, which is is fine. So I think it's it's the it's the beer world's the craft beer world's first experience of something kind of like that, which is almost good in a way to be to be put on that kind of stage, not just Super Bowl, but on television of, you know, all of a sudden craft beer is now, like, the, those words are on, on TV. I so that I think it, it, it's a good and a bad thing, obviously, but I, I think it, the good outweighs the bad, where it's just like, I think it's it, it's all it's all gold because then if you saw Ninkasi's uh, come back, yeah. you see that video? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. It was so good. But, I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, the only thing I would say, you know, it's fine, you know, to define your brand and your product. I got annoyed that they mocked the people enjoying the other product. You that's know, that yeah, we product. mock it too. It wasn't about we, the Carla, we we I, we mock it too. I mean, but, there are certain. Do we, have, do we really run around and say talk about bud drinkers? Or unfortunately, do some, unfortunately, some like do. Blood? I I think I think some I people do. I mean, uh, to me, I've always stood by the fact that, you know, like, it takes a hell of a lot of work to make beer as consistently as Budweiser does. Fine. Even well, there's a time and a place for that. Fine. Yep. Yep. But it's not, but I don't sit around going, everybody who drinks Bud's a freaking idiot. No, my dad drinks Bud. I, you know, it, it's just. And that guy's an idiot. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Never you know, mind. I, I, don't, I don't feel like the craft industry has spent an, a, a lot of effort character, characterizing the macro drinker. In yeah. the same way that yes. the bad character Carla, do you, craft do you not remember do you not remember Stone's fizzy yellow stick character I'm on a cruise ship video? I do uh, not uh, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, I know the fuzzy so, yellow beer is for wussies thing. Fizzy yeah, yellow it was, is for wussies, but that even that's about the style. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. We're, we're, so, we're missing we're Sorry, I was gonna, I was gonna ask Eric to jump in if he wanted to. Yeah, well, yeah. I haven't got to say my side though, too. Though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Say, the Sean yeah. Jansen side. We have a guest on the show. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. so I guess think first. I, one thing I'll say is, from a, 
you know, Carla mentions uh, Budweiser. Well, it was a Budweiser commercial, right? So it's a brand that AB owns. It's not all of AB, right? It wasn't. Right. It, has, it wasn't an InBev commercial. Right. So so Budweiser's got their brand, and they got the bucks, and they're gonna they're gonna do that advertising, and even if it kind of bashes their own uh, InBev's other brands. It's certainly. So. That's their that's their responsibility, I guess. But I love the fact that it makes it it brings craft beer to the stage, and you know by by calling out your competitor, and so now they've acknowledged that craft beer is a competitor to Budweiser, right? Yeah. They brought us to the main stage, so now like <laughs> I uh, uh, Tony McGee from Lagunitas says in his book, you know the the keys to the the, the keys to the to the beer world are being handed down to the craft beer. Uh, the craft beer world. We have an opportunity in front of us to own the next generation of beer. And then I think Budweiser pretty much acknowledged that. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. obviously they're threatened, the brand is threatened by craft beer, otherwise they wouldn't be outright bashing it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, <laughs> I hate to reference the Ninkasa video, I love to, the Ninkasa video had a guy by the fermenter <laughs> who was picking up hops and just like throwing it at the, at the kettle. <laughs> that, was yes. a, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. So is that what goes on? I've never even I've never been to a brewery yet. <laughs> uh, Brew Hampshire video came out just a little while ago too, which was oh, really? uh, their own take on it. Yep. Oh, what? Okay, I gotta, I'll, I'll look it up after the show. It's awesome. So, uh, Sean, the, the, the carpet is rolled out. Well, it would have been easier to go before Eric, actually. <laughs> oh, oh, here it is, yeah. <laughs> what, do you got? what do you got? Basically, what I was going to say is that while watching the movie with, with, the, with my family and friends, uh, we kind of looked at each other and said it was kind of like an awe and shock. And to me, I just laughed at it because I thought it was just – I thought it was more – it was – it was. I, I've seen many other videos where it goes the opposite way and it's just kind of uh, going – going the opposite direction, so I just kind of... Yeah. I, I found it more comical than, than insulting or anything like that. Train break. Um, I... <laughs> I <laughs> should have kept that on. That was great. <laughs> That's a way to mute me out. But <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought it was... I thought it was more so um, thought-provoking and overall... Um, it really was kind of like whacking the beehive. Um, and if you wanted to create... Uh, buzz, either either negative or positively, um, that was probably one of the strongest ways to do it. I I do think that I do think that there's one problem that there was a little bit poor timing. A lot of these videos are probably made four to five months in advance. Um, I don't think I don't think that the Elysian thing was taken into account beforehand, no. No. Um, which was I I feel bad for them because that is a bit insulting. Yeah, I don't. Know that that was that was not done intentionally to a legion, and I think really if someone was going to choose a pumpkin peach beer, they were trying to find a beer that somebody probably wouldn't be making. Um, so you could right. you could probably choose any ingredients, and there's some brewery out there that has made a beer with those different things into it. It would have to be like some like asteroid and like space juice or something like that where. Or maybe someone has never made a beer with that to be able well, to not running, offend a specific brewery. You're running out of things pe- that people have never made a beer with. I mean, like every every yeah. other there's like oh and whale balls and you know what I mean? Like you're yeah, we're getting close. Yeah, there Perfect. is a there is a smoked whale testicle beer. Yes, there is. Yes, yes. yes. Oh man. So uh, yeah, uh, it's um, I, I'm on I'm more on the on the positive camp. Like like Eric said, we're on the now it's we. The, the craft beer community is, is on the stage, but again, there's going to be those people that, that there in in any argument, there's those people that, that are going to take it to the extremes. There are people that smell beer like that and are too critical of Budweiser. There are people like that, and it is what it is. But uh, as Peter Eggleston said in my book, New Hampshire beer, <laughs> we're going to see the summit. Uh, <laughs> Page forty-seven. <laughs> it's in stores now. Yeah, I don't know what page it's on. No, but he said, uh, he said there are there's a place in time for every beer. He said if if the line is long for a Smutty Nose at Fenway, but the, there's a short line for like a Miller, he's going in it because it's a hot day at Fenway Park because there's a you can, there's a time for beer. So there it is. You, you can you could call him up and ask him. He told me that it's in the book. Read it. But I, uh, yeah. Just quick, quick, teeny little thing. Did yeah. you see Miller's response to this? No. Miller yeah, actually just take a, tweeted this thing saying, saying we are fussy and we have great craft brands and fuck you basically. Like it was, hey, it was nice. a big it was a big like ooh. <laughs> so that was interesting because Miller so, took the chance, Miller took the risk of differentiating themselves from A B. Um, which is which is really interesting. 
The, um, champ- the, the they champagne also had beers. A, they so. also had a picture. You know, it was basically a picture. They had you know like text and then, but they had uh, Blue Moon and Coors and whatever like all in one picture, which they rarely ever do because they don't really like people to know that they make Blue Moon and da da da. So they they took the totally opposite tact. They went. You know, yeah. we, we embrace this, and we're not making fun of our brands because we like them. So, haha. So it was please, really, please buy that, our beer. That blew my mind. I think more than a lot of the other people doing like parodies and stuff. It was like, oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. know how much risk that is, anyways, though. Oh, for them, it's 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 pennies. It's it's but it's still it's 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 an interesting. It's not really risky. It's more of a here it is. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure the champagne of beers is selling just fine, but uh, but they but but for them to to kind of, I'm sure they gain more customers that way than than saying. Ha ha! Here, here to what they said. Ditto. Well, one of the things that's uh, so far been um, been shown in the sales since the Super Bowl, the number of actually uh, bud uh, sales have actually increased on an, an increasing trend. Because it, because it's because of that stupid puppy commercial. It's not because of that other commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the puppy one with the, with the with the wolves. Cute as hell. Cute as hell. The, the great, great commercial with the horse. Like, half the commercials of the Super Bowl, I, I watch and I laugh, and I'm like, wait, wait, what were they advertising? Like the like the one with uh, Heisenberg or Walter White. Yeah. It's a drugstore, but I forget what the heck was going on. I don't know. But any final thoughts on the Super Bowl in general? Because <laughs> great game. It was we a really good game. It was quicker than I thought it was going to be. Like they, had, uh, they, had the, they had Gronk during the parade today uh, d- down in uh, Natty Ice. And there's there's I saw this weird thread, I think, that Norm started. Oh, geez, I hope that, that Duck Boat has a limousine license because he's drinking in public. I'm like, I'm pretty sure they're not going to – they better not do anything pressing charges against the – This Duck Boat guy gets in yeah. trouble. Oh, my God. Awesome. But yeah. Well, I'm sure you'll be seeing more of Bronk, uh, Gronk, uh, Brian, on WWE, so – <laughs> and the, and the only thing I've heard of of the entire Super Bowl on my feed was he's going to, he's going to WrestleMania. I'm like, thank God, thank, yeah, thank God, someone's coming crossing into my world. So uh, yeah, I, I appreciate all the uh, all the all the hate tweets, you know, of not watching football. But you know, it's a, n- another year down. It'll start back up once baseball starts too. But uh, it takes yeah. a real man to, to to spend the time watching real uh, housewives uh, marathon. So yeah, I, I I misspoke. It was um, Vanderpump Rules. It's a different show. But anyway, it's a long story short. <laughs> all the all all the ladies that watch the show know exactly what I'm talking about, and uh, my wife included. But for, enough about that. Eric, I'm sorry we talked about housewives while you're on this show. That's that was not my intent. This is a beer podcast. <laughs> so Eric. <laughs> How can uh, people connect with you from a social media aspect? Yeah, we can. Uh, you can find us on uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. At uh, Kelson Brewing uh, is our our handle on everything, and uh, so and our website is kelsonbrewing.com. Uh, you can you can subscribe to our newsletter, email newsletter on the on the homepage of our website, and that keeps you up, up to date on all the new beer releases and events that we have going on. So we, that's a pretty thorough weekly newsletter. Nice. So yeah, those are the, the three main channels that we manage. And the, do you the ha- go, Shauna, Sorry. Do you have any upcoming events that you would like to share w- with our listeners? Oh, we sure do. So uh, craft, we'll be at the craft beer cellar in Nashua on Friday, nice. and uh, that's uh, going to be a free beer tasting down in Nashua. Uh, we're going to be let's see. I guess the event in Keene is private. Um, what else is going on? But Friday, this Friday, we'll do the, the that craft beer cellar event, so that'll be that'll be good. Nice, and then uh, again, uh, Portion you're also be- sorry in beer of the month at uh, Tilted Kilt in Nashville. That's right, yeah, Ooh. Tilted Kilt, great uh, great scenery, great beer. Um, <laughs> so Space Town Pale Ale and uh, Paradigm <laughs> Brown Ale uh, will be on tap right now, and then we'll have some rotating taps throughout the month. So probably get your hands on our Battle Axe IPA and Double Battle Axe um, and others. So I think the couple, uh, main couple takeaways from this this here podcast. Um, number one, when you buy a bottle of Kelson, you're also buying the coolest key that unlocks the the biggest beer geek ass like asset thing ever is the number on the bottle. So yes. check out check that out and and and, and type it in. And and uh, Carla, I challenge you to you uh, to, to 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 tweet when you find a bottle of Kelson and get oh, one. Well. And, and then and then your experience, but yes, that's a big takeaway. And then uh, the, obviously the the imperial stout that's out, or and the Russian imperial stout that's uh, coming. That's this it's uh, incubating right now. It's excellent. Yeah. Sounds good. 
But yeah, um, with that, I mean, do you have any, any questions for us before we kind of end, end the show? I don't. I uh, I really appreciate you guys having me on and uh, and letting Kelson have a chance to to get out there to the interwebs. So Absolutely. thank you so much for having us. That's great. Uh, Sean, Carla, any uh, final uh, final thoughts? Nope. Sweet. Yada. Say what? Yada. Yes. <laughs> that's, our, that's our toast to friendship is vinata. Well, then, hey, then that's for the first time I'm ever saying it. So uh, vinata to everyone, and uh, cheers, and we'll, we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers. cheers.